He said, John, what do you do? And I said, I'm an engineer. And he looked at my results and he said, no, you're not. And um, finally, he said to me, look, what I'm telling you is, is you, you have done what you've done in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. And that was a pivotal moment in my life, to be honest with you. You're listening to the Blacktop Banter Podcast, the premier podcast in the asphalt industry made for contractors with contractors. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Blacktop Banter. And if you've been following the Blacktop Banter team and myself along at all, uh, you've known that we've been traveling quite a bit and attending a lot of shows and seminars and expos. And we were fortunate enough last year to attend Dirt World Summit in Houston. And while there, uh, we were at the Dynapack booth. And right on the backside of the Dynapack booth, I kept hearing people talk about entree leadership, Ramsey Solutions and whatnot. And I'm like, hey, I know that stuff. I think I'm, I think I did some of that stuff while I, on Sundays in church once in a while when I was a young man growing up. And peeked around a corner and uh, made a connection there with the Entree Leadership team. And I was like, I would love to have somebody explain what Entree Leadership does to um, our audience here at Blacktop Banter. So they were very fortunate enough to send over John Falcons, who will join us today. John Falcons is the Executive Director of Entree Leadership Elite. And he's got some construction history, so we're going to get into it. His LinkedIn bio, which I told him I'm going to read, and he's like, I don't remember at all what that says, but please have at it, states, I'm on a mission to help leaders reach their God-given potential. The good news is that everybody can get better. The bad news is it isn't easy to see the blind spots or stay in our sweet spot when we're getting pulled in so many different directions. We all see potential through and fulfilling our potential is attainable and worthy goal trying to be someone we're not is a mirage that will elude us and hollow payout even if we think we've arrived and here's the punchline to all this growing your business begins with growing yourself man thanks so much for joining us today john i appreciate it wow thanks thanks for having me and thanks for the reminder on what my linkedin profile (laughs) says (laughs) yeah aren't you happy it says that like (laughs) There's guys that we get on once in a while and they're like, oh, like 10 years ago, I was a different man. And that's when I wrote that. So, uh, you know, please do uh, or please don't. So I appreciate you being on here and joining us. It's it's a blessing to have you guys here and uh, and My have honor. you represent Andre, Andre Leadership. So I kind of want to jump into it like right away. Like what we do here at Blacktop Banter is always like give us the origin story of mm. how John got from. Uh, John, the high school kid to John, who uh, now is uh, doing his thing with Ramsey Solutions and the Andre leadership team. Part of that story had construction in it. So feel free to dabble in that a little bit if you would. Uh, Okay. Well, uh, that was a high school was a long time ago, Marvin. I mean, you look like a fairly young man. Uh, We could be here for a while, but uh, I'll try and be brief. Okay. I appreciate that. (laughs) Well, actually, I think where I would pick up my story uh, that, you know, that might be of interest today is I was actually in um, my college years and I had started college really not knowing what to do and Mm -hmm. then um, took some time off because I was just kind of wandering around. Sure. And I started uh, working in construction, uh, residential construction. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day... Uh, a friend of mine uh, that I knew through church came by the the job site, and um, I was uh, what was I doing? I was roofing. I was putting on asphalt shingles. Been there in the middle of summer. Been there. And um, he looked up at me and he said, "You need to get back in school." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm in the school and making money. Leave me alone." <laughs> and uh, and so I brushed him off. Yep. And then uh, he came back about a, you know, a half a year later and it was winter time and I was digging uh, foundation trenches for another project. Whew. And the contractor that was there that had done the demo actually uh, hadn't removed all the debris from the job. He knocked the house down and um, never really got off his, uh, his backhoe. Oh, I was yeah. going to say something else, but I substituted <laughs> backhoe there. Uh, <laughs> And um, he just buried a lot of the the construction debris. So mm. I was having to dig through all this trash to make foundation footings. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, my same friend came by and it was raining. And so I'm about up to my knees in muck 
and he looks down at me and I looked up at him and I just remembered that day when I was on that roof laying those asphalt shingles. And I said to him, what kind of degree did you say I should get? (laughs) (laughs) And he said, I think you ought to go to school and get a degree in engineering and uh, you'll still be in construction, uh, but you'll be on the other end of this food chain. And, uh, you know, I thought I'm going to at least give this a look. So I went back to school uh, and I got a degree in civil engineering, but Mm -hmm. I played basketball in high school. I didn't go to math class. Right. So I just absolutely beat my brains out getting through engineering school. It killed me. Uh, I mean, it didn't kill me uh, completely, obviously. Um, But close. But but close. I mean, I had to retake uh, every calculus class at least once. My kids aren't. My, my kids aren't going to hear this, are they? I don't think so. Okay, all right. Maybe someday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't get the best grades, uh, yeah. at least not the first time around, but I wouldn't give up. And um, so I got a degree in civil engineering, and I got a job uh, just because it was less expensive to hire me than keep answering my phone calls uh, sure. with an engineering firm. Sure. And I didn't last um, very long in an office mm. and they shipped me out to a, a job site. Okay. And, um, I just liked, you know, I liked the, I don't know what you call it, the real world. I liked being outside. I liked building stuff more than yes. sitting at a computer. And, um, I got, it was a bridge construction company. Okay. So I wasn't, you know, I wasn't working for an asphalt contractor. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, bridges have got a handful of line items Oh, yeah. And massive quantities, right? Whereas, you know, commercial construction's got a, you know, a massive item list with smaller quantities. Well, we had a whole lot of concrete, a whole mm. lot of asphalt, a whole lot of structural steel. And um, at that time I was in California. So we were doing a lot of seismic work, work because in California, of course, we, we really know how bridges fall down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't realize the biggest earthquake fault in the United States is under the Mississippi River. Really? It's called the Ma- New Madrid Fault. Uh, and in the 1800s, uh, it th- was the last time of a significant event there. And um, Mississippi River ran backwards and there was aftershocks for days. Wow. Created a big lake called Real Foot Lake in, in West Tennessee. And so uh, at some point, somebody said we should reinforce the bridges over the Mississippi River against earthquakes. You know, can't you can't earthquake proof a bridge, yeah. but you can make it resistant to earthquakes. And so uh, I came with my company from California and we started working out in the, the middle of uh, the Mississippi River. I was going to say nowhere, uh, the middle of yeah. nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we, we uh, the I-40 bridge, the Hernando de Soto bridge was the, the big project that we were working on. It took a, a lot of years to do that. And I was actually there uh, during 9-11. So wow. frequently, or I should say occasionally, we had to stop traffic on that, that bridge. And it's a, you know, it's I-40, it's an interstate. So you don't do that casually, you know, it's a big deal to stop traffic, but in Memphis, and if I'm getting too detailed, you move me along here. No, no, no. I like the story. Okay. Keep going. Okay. (laughs) In Memphis, that's where FedEx is headquartered. So you stop the traffic on that bridge, you're going to stop the, you know, the cars and the trucks, but you're still going to have FedEx planes flying over your head because they fly 24 seven. Okay. But on 9-11, I'll never forget. I was standing out in the middle of that river, but up on a bridge with a federal agent next to me. And uh, there were no planes in the sky and no cars going over that bridge. Wow. And uh, I'll never forget that. And, and uh, funny enough, two, two good old boys were coming up the river uh, in their catfishing boat. Uh, and I said to the federal agent, I said, what are, what are we going to do if those two guys stop? Yeah. Uh, at the base of this bridge and, you know, start doing something because nobody knew what was going on the morning right. of nine 11. And, um, he leaned over the side of that bridge with his assault rifle and he said, don't, don't worry. I'll, I'll move them along if they get too close. Dang. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> and, uh, fortunately for them, they just kept on, uh, scooting along on the river. Wow. Man. And, uh, uh, so then from there, you know, I worked, I, I worked in bridge construction, I don't know, a dozen years or so. And then I got invited to be on a, um, a leadership team at my church actually. And they okay. brought in a, 
a management consultant and, and team building guy, a coach to work with that leadership team and just help us be an effective team. And um, I'll never forget Marvin. He, he had his own, uh, you know, personality assessment that he made each of us take so we could kind of figure out what our personality was, all this touchy feely stuff. You know, yep. I'd never been exposed to it before. And uh, he looked over his glasses at me like this and he said, John, what do you do? And I said, I'm an engineer. And he looked at my results and he said, no, you're not. And um, I argued with him for about three days. And I said, look, man, I said, I I failed a lot of calculus classes to get this engineering stamp. (laughs) Like, don't take this from me. And um, finally, he said to me, look, what I'm telling you is, is you, you have done what you've done in spite of who you are, not because of who you are. Mm. And that was a pivotal moment in my life, to be honest with you. And um, I, I pretty much said to him, okay, I want to be you when I grow up. How, how do I learn to do, you know, uh, what you did for me, for, for other people? And I started working with him. Wow. And, um, and actually, he was out of, the reason why I asked you where you're from is because he was out of Green Bay. Okay. And so I, I spent a lot of time flying into either Madison or Green Bay yep. and working with him and, and learning the trade that I, that I do now. But it's been a, it's been a really fun adventure. And um, really a, an honor to help people go and go from being really good at the trade that they're good at to becoming a good leader. Because as you know, as a contractor, there comes a point where, you know, you're laying asphalt and, and then one day you look up and you're like, I, I don't lay asphalt anymore. What, what I do is I lead a group of people that do that. Correct. And that's yeah. a completely different skill set than than the construction skill set. It's a leadership skill set, and and that's what I get to do now. Yeah, you, you, we've heard it described as uh, your zone of excellence versus your zone of genius, right? Where like, okay, I perfect I perfected this trade, um, but I don't necessarily know that like it's perfected for me. If I look yeah. over at some of my peers in the industry, I'm like, these guys are way better than I am at doing that, right? But then we get in this realm where uh, I'm in front of the microphone and leading conversation and putting things together. And for some reason, I'm really, really good at this compared to my friends. And yeah. we did last year, I have a coach, personal coach as well, and business awesome. coach. And um, this was the first time we did personality tests and okay. figured it out. And like we all looked up from each other at the results and like we're like, that is totally you. Like this is you, Marvin, you, the reason you're good at podcasting is because you do talk out your thoughts and need reaffirmation from somebody to work your way through them. You're a perfect podcast host, right? I'm like, (laughs) well, I can kind of think on my own too. They're like, well, maybe, (laughs) maybe not. Right. So, um, it allowed us to like, look at things differently. And, um, for the first time ever, I think to, to, to your point, I look at the way that I own and lead my businesses different now and restructured them around that, um, that design and looking for, you know, before man used to just be like, are you, are you good in the heat? You got a strong back. All right, you're in. Right. Right. Um, and now we don't look for that so much. I look for the personality traits and where to plug them in and if they're a good fit or not. And, by golly, they might be fit and be a good person, but maybe that's not what they're best suited for. Maybe they're su- right. more suited to lead or do whatever. So I kind of want to um, get into um, the aspect that you, you, you're you in construction, you know construction, how it works, and um, the engineering side of it. But now in your current role where you're leading business coaches and, and whatnot, um, what advice would you give leaders – in construction uh Mm. you know we're we're at a the time is changing times change and and we're at a point where uh we're at some of these events and we realize that we need to give a safe place to people right and Mm. different things so i kind of want to get your perspective on that as listen it's hard for us as business owners because we're like dude i pay you a wage come do the come do the work that's why we're here it's what we do and that's not necessarily how um employees want to be employees anymore yeah. um so what do we do there what advice do you give construction leaders in construction you know it's it's interesting that uh you bring this up um you know i grew up hearing things like you're not paid to think mm, yeah, yes. you know, I, i'm Heard not paying for your opinion about a million right. times yeah right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um but the problem is uh 
if you if you hire people and and you create an environment where um, you're not paying them to think or you don't want them to think, mm-hmm. it creates this situation where you have to tell them every single step mm. that needs to be done. It, it, they they become codependent upon you to think for them. Wow, yeah. and that's um, it's like it might be a, a quick way to get somebody started, but it's very short-sighted. Mm. Um, you know, I, I remember being in a conversation with a, a general in the Air Force, and he's at the Pentagon, and I mean, he had a lot of, he had a lot of stuff on his uniform. I don't know what any of it meant, <laughs> right. but there were a lot of shiny things on there. And um, he was talking about this very thing, Marvin, and he was saying, you know, I, I'm really struggling to get people to, um, my, my guys, to give me feedback or mm. tell me what they think. And I just naively said to him, I'm like, but you're in the military. Like you give the orders and they do what they're told. And it was interesting because he said, that's true when we're in combat because we have to act. Well, for one, lives are on the line. And two, we have to act as a unit. Hmm. We, you know, if you've ever seen anybody like the, the, the Thunderbirds or the Blue Angels, these these groups of pilots, right? Yep. They they don't say, "Hey, does how would everybody feel about going left now?" Like, would would was, does <laughs> right. feeling you know does it feel good to go left? No. They somebody gives a command and they all turn left together because they're acting at, as this unit. There's no place for that. Right. In a sense, they're 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 under fire. I know that they're not in a at an air show in combat, but they're simulating that, right? Right. Um, I've worked with both kinds of of construction leaders, one that is given the orders and telling everybody what to do and telling people don't think. And then I've worked with the, the ones that are that act more as a coach. And the thing is, is I have seen the ones that are the command and control leaders, uh, you know, have their job site, have their crews just grind to a halt if they're not there to tell people what to do. Yeah. Yeah. We've and seen that's, it. it's, you know, it's not what you as the leader want, and it's not what the crew wants either. Right. Because you're basically just telling them, you're an animal, go pick that heavy thing up and bring yeah. it over here. And that's that's demeaning, and people don't want that. Yeah. And not only that, like, you're, if they screech to a halt and you're not around, then you're wasting resources. That's right. You're wasting time and money and everything. You yeah. What's the, you, most, what's the most expensive thing on a job site? Time. Time. Yeah, time. And if the work stops when you, when you got to run to go get supplies... You're wasting a whole lot of it. You you used a phrase there that I haven't ever heard before, um, command and control. Can you uh, define that for me real quick? Like that's, you said define uh, or uh, command and control leadership, right? Yeah. Yeah. What is, it, what is that? That That's the, the style of leadership where I have the control of every decision. What I say goes and we, we you don't do anything other than what I tell you to do. You know, I give the commands and I am in control. And so, so I've when, seen leaders like that. The problem is when they encounter something outside of the normal system, then there's no forward thinking or movement because there's no one there to say the words. Yes. And if the crew gets to the size that they can't give commands to each person on that crew then people do have to make decisions for themselves and you have a group of people that you haven't taught to make decisions Mm. and problems start there. I'm incredibly proud of the Blacktop Banner Edition seal coating unit produced in partnership with KM International and available in both 550 and 700 gallon versions. Custom built on the same frame as their bulletproof hot boxes, I work closely with KM to design what I believe is the best seal coating unit on the market a unit designed by a contractor for contractors. Learn more about the unit and to see a walkthrough of the entire unit by visiting kminternational.com. In my opinion, Dynapack CC900G Roller is the best roller on the market for driveway and small parking lot paving contractors. The seismic technology in these rollers is unbeatable for the smoothness and compaction they provide, and I choose the Dynapack CC900G over the little yellow roller that you're used to seeing every single time. But don't just take my word for it. Check them out in person at Pavex and World of Asphalt or visit Dynapack.com to find a dealer near you. Hey Blacktop Banner fans, this is Michael with Aquafault. 
Say goodbye to potholes and roadway damage without the need for large crews, heavy equipment, or toxic chemicals. Aquafault is the only permanent repair material for asphalt and concrete that uses water. An installation is simple. Just pour, add water, and tamp. It's that easy. An Aquafault repair can be open to traffic immediately and fully sealed within 24 hours. Plus, the product is backed by a three-year warranty and made in the USA. Visit Aquafault.com. That's A-Q-U-A-P-H-A-L-T dot com to learn more. In the past year, Jobber has been our CRM of choice at Wiscode, and it's made our world exponentially better efficiency-wise. The request to quote and quote to invoice process is seamless and professional. The scheduling aspect keeps us on point and the team leaders moving throughout the day from project to project, while the timesheet feature tracks the team members' hours. For our small seal coding company, it has helped build the solid foundation we can scale from. Jobber is now a sponsor of Blacktop Banter and helps bring this show to you. With this partnership, Jobber is offering an exclusive savings to BB listeners of 20% off for six months. To take advantage of this, find the Jobber link in the show description and get to improving your process today. Hi, contractors. It's Kyla from Wiscoat. We use Stencil Plus for all of our pavement marking stencils, alphabet letters, numbers, directional arrows, handicap markings, you name it. We use it and we get it all from Stencil Plus. Right now, for a limited time, you can save 10% on your stencil order by using code BB10 during checkout at stencilplus.com or by calling 877 372 6055. How do you influence the people that that you work with or, or work for, or I guess that you have as like foremen or leaders or whatever, like your your team? How do you influence your team productively to make this shift? Yeah. So let me just say on the front end of this, Marvin, that I'm going to give you an answer, but I don't want me giving you an answer to make it sound like it's easy because it's not. Mm. This is not an easy thing. It's not a microwave solution. This is going to take some time. You're going to screw it up. You're going to have to you know, go back and apologize, uh, which doesn't always happen a whole lot on a construction site. That's true. Um, you're you're going to skin your knees, but you're going to have to keep trying. So that, that's my that's my my boilerplate like on the front a of my disclaimer. Answer. I like yeah, a disclaimer my... before I get an answer. <laughs> that's right. So you know, I'd say there's four there's four key things: uh, rapport, credibility, trust, and then influence. Mm. So let me unpack those a little bit. Rapport, fancy word for just getting to know people, connecting with with guys. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's a real old cliche: people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm, that's true. And, and so, you know, not looking at, not looking at guys on a construction site, like they're just units of production. Yeah. You know, asking them, how's your family? What's going on? How are your kids? You know, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, n- never mind. Don't tell me any more about that. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and just treat them like people. Now you can't do this and, and just be doing it to check a box. Yeah. I mean, what this really is, is actually care about people. Genuine genuinely care about people because you know which seems touchy feel or whatever you guys in construction a lot of times uh this is not what they're used to talking about i'm not saying you got to start running therapy sessions on your job site right but like you know and i don't want to be too cliche but just ask them like what'd you think of the game like yeah. man you know that was did you did you watch the you know this game or did you watch that game? Did you think they were gonna like just have a conversation like say, you would? You're talking treat humans like they're humans. That's it. Wow, <laughs> what a novel! What a novel <laughs> theory! Revolutionary, yeah. huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It starts there, and then the next step is credibility, mm. and and that is as hard as and as simple as doing what you say you're gonna do. Mm. So from a leadership perspective, telling your guys, we're going to knock off at this point, or if we get to this point, we're going to stop. If, you know, um, you showing up on time when you're requiring them to show up on time, Mm -hmm. you know, doing what you say you're going to do, you're going to earn their respect Mm -hmm. because you're, you're respecting yourself first and you're, and you're just, um, having integrity can be really hard, but not super complicated. Right. That's credibility. Then I said the next step is trust. A lot of times I get the question, wait a minute, trust and credibility? Aren't, aren't those the same thing? I was just literally going to ask that question. <laughs> Got me. 
the You've done this a couple it, times. I can tell. <laughs> the difference is credibility is doing what you say you're going to do. Trust is me being a me being confident in you having my back. Mm. So I. I trust you, Marvin, because I know you well enough. I know you, you know, you, you respect me. I respect you. Uh, you treat me like a human. And when it comes time to uh, make a decision about whether we're going to, you know, work out in traffic or not, yep. I trust that you're not going to put me in harm's way. Mm -hmm. that you're going to spend the extra money to put up concrete barriers, or you're going to, you know, you're going to spend the money to, to get the lighting. If we got to work at night or like, I trust you, I I put my life in your hands. I put my paycheck in your hands. I put my future in your hands. Um, that's, that's not just doing what you say you're going to do. That's me trusting how you think. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, the last step is influence and influence is me actually caring what you think. So this is, this is not, uh, me caring what you think because you sign the front of my check and I sign the back of my check, right? right? You're going to get some influence with me because you sign my check. And that's not, that's not, that baseline is not what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You can tell that you've got influence with your guys when they come to you and they say, Marvin, you know, my daughter's 16 and I'm, I'm scared to death to let her drive. Mm. I know you've got an 18 year old daughter. Like, how did you handle that? Yeah. Like they care what you think. They start to seek you out, uh, about how to handle situations where, whether it be on the job, you know, maybe it, maybe you as the contractor are talking to a, a super or a foreman and they're saying, I got this guy on my team and, you know, he just tested positive for whatever he shouldn't test positive for. Yeah. Like, how should I handle that situation? Like, I know, you know, what we're supposed to do by the policies, but like, this this guy's young and I want to shepherd him through this. What should I do, Marvin? Like, how have you handled this in the past? That's having influence with people. You can have a title without that, but you're, you're not going to have real influence with people unless you do the work of walking those steps. Yeah. So, so ideally when we look at that as an idea, it's like somebody who, you know, Hey, we need an executive director of operations. All right. Well, we've hired somebody. He gets there and because he's the executive director of operations, we're at the check stage, right? Where Mm -hmm. he signs the front, signs the back. Yep. But as you said, that's not going to, it's not going to have the influence that we want it to have. He has to go through those first three steps before we get to the influence side. Yep. I'm, I'm, I want to ask you about some other things because here we are talking about people and, uh, and getting people and people hiring. Um, there's been a struggle and as much as we don't want to look at it, it's there. We know it's there. Our friends at build wit and dirt world are tackling it. You all are tackling it. We try to tackle it here at blacktop and by bringing on guests like yourself and others. Um, and it's the workforce, man. Like mm. it's a tough one. Um, we, we hear all these things about what we should do, how we have to work with people now and and these different things. The workforce and personnel is getting tough. It's hard to keep people, but it's getting harder to keep good people as well. Um, whether it's a good foreman or whatever, uh, any insight on, on how we do that? Because our goals are to grow and become the best business owners, uh, leaders that we can, but, dang, it sure is getting harder. It feels like. Yeah, no, no doubt. This is, this is another one of those things. Like I got to give that pre answer. Please do. It's not easy. So nothing I'm going to say is just going to like magically make it easy. But I, but I, I also won't shy away from your question and tell you how we're tackling that problem. But you know, I can't help myself as a coach. Let me ask you when, when you say it's, uh, you know, the the good people we're losing good people. Mm Mm-hmm. Where are they going? What, why do we, why, what, what are you seeing as why they're leaving? Uh, I would say two things. One would be maybe better opportunity, mm. and the other would be better culture. Okay. Am I on? So you know what's awesome about that answer, Marvin? You can control both of those things. Whew. That's a relief. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The bad side or the flip side of that is, is it's not easy. I was just going to say, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, right? So, 
So let's say culture and opportunity. Let's tackle culture first. Sure. Culture, culture, you know, is how a group of any group of people acts and makes decisions. That's culture. You see different nations have culture, different cultures. Uh, different families have different cultures, different cities have cultures. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm thinking right now, you know, about to be Super Bowl t- time, different teams have cultures. Mm-hmm. You can see it, you know, just in how the fans act, all of it. So every company is a group of people and therefore has a culture. It's not whether we have culture or we not uh, have culture. So how do we make our culture better? How do we improve the culture? Well, Ground zero for the culture in an organization is the leader, because the culture of an organization is just an echo of the leader's character. And so if you're hard driving, you know, you're, uh, you take yourself seriously, whatever you are as a leader, that is going to affect the culture of the organization a whole Mm -hmm. lot. So, you know, we like to say, Hey, you're the problem. You're the solution. Like the, (laughs) The, the key to great culture is staring you in the mirror every morning. Mm-hmm. And so treating people really well, taking care of them, being respectful, not talking down to guys, uh, you know, working those steps to influence, all of those things is, is where that starts. Mm. There's other things though, right? Because if you, I like to think in pictures because I'm a real simple guy, right? But if you think of a big old tree, and you think of the roots that are down in the ground that you can't see. Well, think of those like the, the things that are important to you or the things that you believe about people. One of the crazy things about us here at Ramsey Solutions is uh, we believe that gossip, talking negatively about somebody else, is a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's a part of our culture. Well, what grows up out of the ground of that is um, a policy, an oper- we'll call it an operating uh, procedure or policy. And that is, we catch you gossiping about somebody one time, you're going to get warned. If we have to warn you again, we'll fire you for gossip. Mm. So now imagine on construction sites, Yep. how much gossip happens, how much bad mouthing happens about the, the owner, the superintendent, the foreman, the inspector, the subcontractors, the general contractor, I mean, it's just people are bitching left and right oh, all yeah. day long on construction sites. Yep. So imagine if if you put a stop to that on your construction site, at least to the to the extent that you're able with your guys, and say, hey, it's not good to tear people down, so we're not going to do it. And if I catch you doing it, you're you're taking a day off without pay, or you know, I'm making mm-hmm. that up. Whatever you want to tell them. Mm-hmm. And after a while, they start to get the message and they stop doing that. And then people start to realize, you know what? When I'm not on a job, somebody's not stabbing me in the back. Somebody's not running me down. These are my brothers, you know, that we're, we're at war together here and we've yeah. got each other's backs. That's a group of people that you want to work with. That's a group of people that you're not going to leave to go make 10 cents an hour someplace else and have to put up with that trash on another job site, at least with my crew. I know yeah. we can't control every crew on the job, but you know, good thing about asphalt is, is you don't usually have a whole bunch of different trades on top of you, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when you're out there in the middle of the road laying asphalt. Yeah, that's because no one else wants to do it. That's why. That's right. Nobody uh, else wants to do it. My right. my old boss used to say, "I know it smells bad, boys, but that smells like money to me." Yes, but sir. That's d- d- different subject. It's the same thing. It's like uh, on the roofing side. You know, I roof from 12 years old to my early twenties. And it was just like, I can smell those shingles. I know what it is. It ain't, don't mean I like it, but (laughs) it is what it is. You know, what you described today on the podcast, like it's, there's a route, there's a route to make it work. The, the biggest issue I always see is that no one likes to be told it's going to be hard, you know? And they're like, ah, it's the same thing with starting your business to begin with. It sounds great. You provide yeah. a service, you go out, give them an invoice to get you a check, you come back. Simple, right? It's <laughs> not. And, and Business you, is easy until people get involved. Man. And, <laughs> and once you get to that point, you're like, oh, I need to hire an accountant. Oh, I got to have somebody else here. Oh, I got to hire a mechanic. It gets complicated. And you don't really realize 
what it really takes to run a successful business and a good business. And I think that, you know, as, as a certain level, when you get to owning your business, you're like, okay, I did all the hard work. I, here we, here it is. I did it all. I didn't know I was going to do it. And then we encounter situations like we, we spoke about today and you're like, oh my gosh, this is going to be hard work again. And it's, yeah. and it's not something that I can see on paper. Like yeah. this is, this is going to be tough. So fortunately, um, you all have developed a way for us to tackle this when we get to a certain point in, uh, in entree leadership. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about entree leadership and how it, how it helps us tackle the stuff that you've talked and spoke about today? Sure. You know, entree leadership, uh, is really our system for running a business. And I love that you said, you said a couple of times, like when you get to a certain level, you know, and we have seen with working with a bunch of companies over the years, tens of thousands of companies that there are in fact, different levels, uh, different seasons to, to pretty much every business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a map for how to navigate all of that, uh, how we've done it. You know, Dave started this business at a, at a little table, like I'm sitting at right now by himself. And now we're on a, you know, I don't know, a 60 acre campus with a bajillion square feet of office space <laughs> and 1100 team members and $300 million a year and all that stuff. And there is a, a way, a path, uh, to go from a card table on a living room to this kind of business. And, uh, that's what entree leadership is, is the, the way that we have done that. And then the way we have, have guided other people that, so that's, that's cool that there's a, a proven system for running your business. And uh, there's areas that you have to focus on. You know, there's six drivers to a business. You got to focus on yourself and why you're doing what you're doing and your team and, uh, you know, the plan that you have and the product that you're actually delivering. And you got you to gotta manage your finances, your profits, so that you have some to reinvest back into the business. Right. And you just got to work that wheel over and over and over again. And it works. Just like Dave's, you know, you were saying uh, you're familiar with our personal finance stuff. That mm -hmm. stuff works. Mm -hmm. You do it, it works every time. You work the six drivers of business. You work our system for, for running a business. It works every single time. Mm. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is what you said earlier. Nobody wants to hear that it's hard. It yeah. doesn't make it easy. It's just going to help you not waste time. It's, it's going to keep you on the rails, or as we like to say down here in the South, between the ditches, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and from running off the road, which we have all done. And we, we like to tell people, Marvin, that, you know, your reward for solving today's problem, or to use your language, your reward for figuring out the level that you're at, mm -hmm. tomorrow you get a bigger problem. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a one-man show and you solve that problem, you figure out how to get some good help and get a couple folks around you, that's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. But now you have the bigger problem of how do I lead a team? Yeah. And you figure out how to lead a team, then you realize, oh, my problem now is how do I scale this to meet the opportunity that's in the marketplace? And yeah. then you figure out how to scale the thing, work smarter, not just harder. Mm -hmm. And then you really start to fire on all cylinders and you think, man, how do we not get too comfortable? And, and we break things before they're broken and we, mm -hmm. and we stay on top of this and stay one jump ahead of this thing. Every day, you're going to get a new problem to solve. And yeah. uh, Entree Leadership is about how to do that. You know, it's not the new problem to solve. I actually enjoy that aspect of it. It's the same problem that I can't solve that bothers me, <laughs> right? Like yeah. that's the one where I'm just like, yeah, eventually, eventually you, I don't know if you ever give up, but you, you start to ignore it. And then mm. it just unravels everything you've worked hard for. And yeah. I think that that's the struggle. That's the dichotomy that we deal with as business owners is like, I, I don't know how to do this. It was like you in the ditch when you were up to your waist. And you're like, I don't know how to get out of here, but I need to know how to get out of here. Right. And I can just keep digging it and I'll do whatever. And I'll to not look at the fact that I shouldn't be in this ditch. And that gets dangerous and it's a slippery, dangerous slope for business owners. So I think the, the relief is, you know, the, the truth that, Hey, it's not easy, but it wasn't easy getting to this point And it's, I don't know, maybe this is just me, John. It's not easy for me 
to look in the mirror every day and know that I don't know how to do this, that I don't know how to tackle this problem. That's hard for me. And I will do whatever the heck I got to do to get over that hurdle because I want to look at myself in the mirror and be like, dang, I like this guy. Um, what, where can people go to learn more about Entree Leadership and what it has to offer? Just go to EntreeLeadership.com. Uh, and that'll, you know, all of our stuff is on that website. You just Google Entree Leadership, which is just a word that we made up. Uh, entrepreneurship and leadership smashed it together. Yep. And uh, you Google Entree Leadership and you'll find us or go to EntreeLeadership.com and, and you'll find about find out about uh, our program Elite, which is our, our tool set to help you work that system and the conferences we put on and, and uh, all that we've got to offer to, to serve, serve y'all. Every time we have a guest on here, Black Top Banter, we end it with a question of what would be a general piece of advice that you would give either yourself when you were young or humans in general um, that you've observed and applied? What would that be? Just a general piece of advice. Like we've always had people like say an old mannerism or something that their grandfather told them or something they learned along the way. Some people are like, you know, read this book. This really helped me. Mm. But um, what would a general piece of advice be as far as living a, a good life? That's not on my list of questions here. I know Marvin. it's that's not. Us. <laughs> I know. I know Megan's going to have me for that one. <laughs> no, but that's that's a probably the best thing we could talk about, right? Mm-hmm. I heard somebody say, so don't don't credit me with this, but I, I heard somebody say that life starts at the end of our comfort zone. And so, you know, you said, man, it's hard to look in the mirror every morning and think, I, I got to go do this again, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's true. But, but if we don't make the decision to get up and try again or try and get that 1% better or just, you know, do the best we can, then what are we doing? Mm-hmm. And so living by, you know, uh, there's a lot of good things to live by, but to answer your question, just to come to grips with that, that life starts, you know, really starts, the adventure starts at the end of our comfort zone, you know? So when you look in the mirror, be willing to go out the door and, and take the punch in the face again, just like, just like Red from Shawshank Redemption says, get, live, get busy living or, or get, get busy, busy dying. dying. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that piece. We've never had anyone say that before. Um, I, the challenges make me feel alive. Otherwise, That's right. I feel like I'm on repeat. Yeah. I, I, I take in the challenges. I get more uncomfortable being comfortable, mm-hmm. which is a kind of a, an ironic thing. John, thank you so much for joining me today, my friend. Thank you, Marvin. Thanks for having me. And John's got some history with it, so I'm going to end with our catchphrase here at Blacktop Banner, and that's We Speak Asphalt. Peace. Hey, everybody. Marvin here from Blacktop Banter. And if you enjoy the podcast and what we've been bringing to the industry, you can support us through a one-time or recurring donation at blacktopbanter.com. There we have a support tab. You click that and choose your path from there. If you listen on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do us a favor and leave a review there for us as well. As always, we speak asphalt and thanks for your support.